experienced a love that I, I've never experienced before. Um, one minute I said hi to this one girl and the next minute I'm sitting on her lap and we're sharing our life story with each other. Um, it was just like nothing I've ever experienced before and I know Courtney would say the same thing. It's, it was just, it was so powerful to see others love others the way God loves us. I've, I've never, I've never seen it so strong before and I genuinely feel it's how God loves me and I, I saw that like in person, which is, you don't see every day. We did a three-day um, youth conference, and then prior to that, we met with about 50 or so of the youth leaders and did a leadership gathering before it. And those of you that know what's going on in Ukraine, just from a political standpoint, know that it was pretty rough before we went there. There was actually a declared state of emergency in the country, and there was some concern of whether we'd be able to get in or get out. And the entire time we were there, there was absolutely no political upheaval whatsoever there was no violence there was nothing happening the entire time we were there in fact we had, at one or two different points during our trip we asked we actually asked is the thing over because there was nothing happening and then we flew out on monday and monday night it completely blew up to the point where if anybody's watched the news at all you'll know that uh it it got pretty bad over there to the point where the uh, president f escaped to the east the far east of ukraine almost russia and is holed up there while the parliament in Kiev voted for new elections in May. So really good things are happening in that nation. And there was one point during the uh, conference with the kids where you have to understand this youth conference is completely different than anything you've ever pictured when it comes to a youth conference. The youth totally lead the event from start to finish. They lead everything. And there's virtually no speaking whatsoever. It's all worship and ministry. And there was a two and a half hour worship session on the on Saturday morning from 10 to about 12:30, where there was hardly any words spoken, but just a prophetic declaration of worship. Where, if you've seen some of the pictures, I probably ought to put some of the pictures up. It's my bad for not doing that ahead of time. But I was amazed at watching these anywhere from 16 to 25 year olds completely go into intercession on behalf of their nation. And at the end of two and a half hours, I leaned over to a couple of my team that were there, and I just said, guys, we just watched a nation be birthed in the spirit, a new nation, as these kids totally sold out and gave them, I mean, these are kids that are on the carpet just crying out to the Lord. At one point, there's like this six foot 17 uh, Ukrainian that I've got my hands laid on, okay? He's huge. And I'm, I'm laying my hands on him, and he's just crying out to the Lord in Ukrainian, and I just, I'm praying over him. He's maybe about 18, 19. And I can just tell that he is just crying out to the Lord. I have no idea what he's saying. And so I finally, I get down and I have my hands on his feet. And I'm praying over his feet. And he gets so overwhelmed by what the Lord's doing that he falls to his knees, grabs my head, puts his mouth against my ear, and in broken English begins to pray for his country as if I'm the Lord. And he's crying out to the Lord into my ear. And it's so loud and it's so strong. And it's someone in broken English crying out for his nation and for a generation to rise up in that nation that will give glory to God. It was unbelievable to watch. And I just, I felt so honored to be a part of that and to help just kind of be near it. I didn't have anything to do with it whatsoever. It was just, if anything, I think me and Randy and some of the other guys were there just to let them know that this is good and you guys should continue in this. And I'm watching these young people lead their nation spiritually. It was beautiful. And to be honest with you guys, I'm crying out for a generation like that right here in America. I really am. Ones that aren't so, can I, can I be honest? Is that okay here? Ones that are less concerned about the new series on Netflix or whatever's going on on their cell phone at the moment. I mean, these kids could care less about any of that stuff. If you could have been there for two and a half hours, we would have repented for our way of life. 
these aren't these aren't poor kids. I mean, these kids have money. They they just have a completely different view of life. I'm not putting a guilt trip on any of us. I tell you, I Maddie and Courtney will tell you, they're walking in a level of spiritual maturity that I am dying to see us walk in. I've told you guys this before. I went there three years ago. And I, I was the first pastor that they have ever had asked to have them pray over him. First time ever. Because most of the pastors there are either intimidated by those kids or think they're crazy. <clears throat> and I had them pray. I, I went over there for that purpose because I had heard about the hunger of God in that nation for God. And I walked into that room. I, I'll never forget it. I had about 15 of them lay hands on me. And an hour and a half later, I don't even know where I am. The ministry over me was so strong, so powerful, so mature. Jesus showed up in such a real way in my life that I came back three years ago and I told this place, I said, I've been born again, again. And it can happen for any of us. I think we need to continually grow in our revelation of Jesus. If we're not, what are we doing? Honestly, church, what are we doing? Why'd you come today? I'm going to ask you this question. Why do we come today? Do we come to grow in our revelation of the Lord or are we coming just to, hey, I'm excited to be where I am? I don't know about you, but I am here to grow today into a greater understanding, a greater experience and encounter with the person of the Lord. Anybody else? That's why I'm here today. And so, Father, I ask for this gathering today, for the next couple of hours. <laughs> Jesus, be real. Don't be a belief system anymore, Lord. Don't be someone of our history, somewhere back in our memory where we, at some Bible's camp or some whatever, we said yes to you. Father, I pray that your son would be a living reality right here in this moment. And we would lay aside all of our worries, all of our cares, and we would completely find ourselves in you today. Jesus. So stand to your feet with me today. Jesus, let the hungry be filled today. Blessed are the hungry, for they shall be filled. We hunger and thirst for you today, Lord. We say like the disciples said, where else can we go? For you have the words of life. Let life flow in this place today, Lord. Let life flow in this place today, Lord. Show yourself strong among us today, Father God. May we leave here and say, we have encountered the Lord. Thank you, Jesus.
up and the harvest is now. He is awakening a new creation across the lands, a creation that comes, brings forth kingdom activity, a creation that embodies his love to the nations, a generation that is solely his. This is the year, this is now. You know, history, history is full, full of people who did nothing, all right? You can't have, like, it's not just the doers. History is full of people who did nothing. I mean, I think about the atrocities of World War II that could have changed history if people did something. I think about the bad report that came out and, and the unwillingness to cross the Jordan at that time. We have a choice. We have a choice of what our role is in history. Do we want to passively sit by, passively let it happen, or do we want to be a part of making it happen? And so I challenge you, don't wait, don't rest, don't sit there and watch it. Participate in life, participate in the kingdom.
what changes the world. If the earth responds, then we fully become. And if that makes the world come alive, then it's our becoming. So I think when it says, wake up, child, he's saying, hey, hey, you know who you are? You're mine. You are royalty. We've got to believe that deep down inside. We don't, it's not enough just to scream it and, and to be really excited about it, but we have to live as it. We have to come alive to who we really are. That's what changes the world. The, the earth, it, it, it grows like desperately. Like, wake up. Please, please set me free. And so when you come into who you are, it sets the world free. It's not about what you do. I think we, what do I do to change the world? And we put so much pressure on ourselves. And the Lord's just like, I just want you. I just want who you are. And I want you to live like it fully every day. And it sets the world free. And then they can, then the world starts screaming, I am royalty. I am in my destiny. I'm coming alive. shake the nations. We're pleading to God, asking God to shake the nations. We are not saying that we're just for the states. We are called to bring his love to the nations. Isaiah 53, 5 says, surely you shall call a nation you do not know, and nations who do not know you shall run to you because the Lord, your God, and the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. It's not just about the states. It's about taking the nations for the kingdom. That as we walk in our identity, he has called us to the nations, to the entire globe, but we're to take it.
take every judgment that is not rooted in Jesus and let it fall to the ground. Every judgment we have about our brother, let it fall right now. Unless that judgment is rooted in the King of Kings, let it fall right now. Come on. Love come. Love come and cover. Love come and uproot. Love come and let the walls fall down. Love come. Love come.
Come on, someone cry out for love. Come. Love, come. Love, come. No more judgment from the church. No more judgment for the church. Love, come. Love, flow like a river. Love, come. Let the judgments fall, Lord. Let the haughty eyes be closed. And let love come. Let pride bow to love. Let self-righteousness bow to love. Love come. Jesus, draw near. Nearer than you've ever drawn before.
We all have things in our lives that buffer our experience of the Lord. And I think we do it because we're afraid of really encountering him and we're afraid that he'll wreck us. But guys, look at Joey and tell me that there's something wrong with being wrecked because there's not. So guys, whatever it is in your lives that's buffering your experience of the Lord, take it off. And this morning, if you need to take off your shoes as a symbol of taking off that thing in your life that's hindering your experience of the Lord, take off your shoes but take off whatever it is in your life that is hindering your full encounter of the Lord because he wants to encounter you and I can promise you you want to encounter him remove the buffer embrace the Lord and it doesn't matter what happens to you let yourself be wrecked because it will change your life for the better let it come let it come guys let it go be free in the Lord, because there's nothing wrong with it. Jesus told me whenever I was at the table with my friend Emily, um, Jesus told me um, that love is down, love is down. He wants everyone to come down to fill his feet and love him. Love wants him to come down. Please, Jesus, let the love come down to you. Let the love come down to people. Let the love come down to anyone else. Please, Jesus, please. 
I want Jesus to come down to me because my mom and me and my brothers, we really miss you, Jesus. And I want you to come down for anyone else who has parents and who else is homeless and everyone else. Please, Jesus, come down.
All we can say is thank you, Jesus. 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 Let's have the ushers come. Let's give big today just like he did. Let's give big today just like he did. He's worthy of this. Thank you, Lord. Jocelyn in the room? Yeah, she's in the room. Oh. We have many wrecked people today. Jocelyn, can you talk or no? All right, Kendall, come here. She's a mess. She can't talk. I love you, Joss. What am I doing? Okay, Saturday. I can't remember the date. But we are doing a, uh, what is it? March 1st. <laughs> Glory to Jesus. Okay, here's what we're doing. We're doing an outreach. This is going to be so cool. I really want to encourage all, all of you to come, really. That would just be crazy. Uh, but we're doing an outreach to Barclay Village again. It's actually our Valentine's outreach that's been postponed at least once. But it's so cool because the Lord is in it. He really is. And... Uh, we're teaming up again with the, uh, the, our Spanish family, our Hispanic family, MCI. And this is going to be so cool because we're going together so proud of you. to deliver uh, like cakes that they've made. And then we're going to pray over and bless every home. So it's really easy. All you have to do is show up. Randy, huh? Is that easy? Just show even, up. Even Randy can do that. Randy's good at showing up. He showed up Thursday night at the shelter. Bam. Okay. So, uh, 11.45 here, and we will carpool or do whatever. We'll go together, and that'll be fun, too. So, please, if you, and, you know, just, like I said, just show up. It's great. See, she got, she's got herself collected. I, I just needed a minute. What? No, no, I just wanted to add to it. That's all. You forget anything. Um. Please, please come and, and please bring your children. I just, I just want you to be a part of the presence of Jesus that we experience there. It is unbelievable the things that happen when we show up in the harvest field where he is already present and working in people's lives. And, and guys, we have, I'm going to mention this. I think it's okay. We have Izzy who... We've, the kids, like a, a week or two ago, sort of commissioned her into her own 
neighborhood to be praying with her. So guys, I want us to, in the spirit, start seeing ourselves joining together with her because she's, she is now intentionally in her neighborhood praying with people on her own. Guys, this is Jesus, and we want to join with her. We're, you know, like we're, he's already there, and he's already planted some really cool powerhouses in that neighborhood. And so just come and bring your kids and, and, I don't know, people you don't even know, come, and they'll experience Jesus with us there. What's going on in you? You sure? All right. Anybody have a testimony of what was just going on in their lives just now in the worship? Anybody want to testify? Come here. Dang, you look good today. Stop playing. I just, I just want to talk about. I just want to talk about. He dropped. God dropped about, about culture in my. In, talk, um, talk to me about culture doing worship. When I came to this place, first of all, I grew up in Mississippi, so I grew up in a predominantly black church. I, but I don't know, it, it, couldn't have been, it was nothing but God that brought me out of, like, you know, I, I didn't care about being a predominantly black, or if you were green, blue, yellow, gold, or Asian. <laughs> and <laughs> and, and um, it seemed like, and, and to me it looked like, you know, in Mississippi, everybody, you know, they, it, it just follows that way, you know, you're in a black church or in a white church, you know. But we was, at our church, we was always open to, you know, having other other ethnicities come to our church. But it, it just, would never, it would, they would come and they would go and they would come and some would stay. But not, and I, when I first came here, I black people. So since I've been over the past two years, it has really grown. Because I'm a very people 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 watcher. And... And I have seen, you know, we have we have more more ethnicities in church that's mixing. But at the same time, I was worried about, you know, the worshiping of the worshiping of God, how they worship. And I was worried about when I left my church, and we were more so like, you know, like this church, we, you know, lift your hands, praise God, you know, and and not afraid to, you know, lay it out on your face on the floor. And and I was worried about that because. Living in Mississippi, it was always thought about the black churches did that, and the, and the white churches just sat down in their chairs and read hymns. <laughs> <laughs> I'm being, I'm being, I'm being very open and honest right now. I'm being very open and honest right now. And but and, and some people understand that because they they haven't seen both sides. But me have, me being seen both sides, me being experienced both sides. Where I experienced, I was in the white church where they where they read the hymns. And you know, and said, so but but he, the the pastor, he was a good teacher, but that's what they did, and that was that was my perception because that's all I knew. But once I once I left, I left Mississippi, went to Iowa, then came here. It's it's it changed the perception. I just thank God for that. And I just started laughing, like you know, when I and I sit here and I see you know, and I, and I, and I just scan the crowd and I see you know we got a praise team, people worshiping, people speaking in tongues, laid out on the floor. I, I, that's, that's, that's what I, I like, that's what I love, that's because, because that's, that's not confining God to just one type of praise. Come on. Thanks, Cameron. Hey, Amen. Anybody else? Oh, sneaking up behind me there. Can we have two opposite people sharing testimonies? My normal disclaimer, I have no idea how this is going to come out, so bear with me. First of all, I want to honor you in a very big way. <clears throat> As you already know, our theology was challenged last night, Janice and I. And it struck me really hard, and it still is. And all throughout today, I was sitting here thinking, who are you? And better yet, who am I? And all through the entire week of Brazil, I didn't tell you guys all of this, but I really questioned myself as to who I am during that week. And God opened up a lot of stuff to me at that time during that week. But what I really fall back on is not only who am I, but who are you? And, and who are we to judge each other in the way that we do? And I'll guarantee you that at some point in some time or another, you and I and everybody has judged one another. What makes you more right than me? Or me more right than you? 
stand up for who you are and what you believe in, and that's where you come into play. And I, I, you have opened our eyes, Janice and I, probably as well as many others here, to a whole other, a whole other level, a whole other realm. And I feel like I'm babbling, so I apologize. But this has been heavy on my heart today. And worship didn't help matters. <laughs> it was good stuff. Yeah, I feel like I'm tanked, so here. <laughs> Give him a hug. Somebody hug him. Anybody else? That's what I know he's doing. Thank you, Lord. Uh, before the kids go, I feel like we need to pray for a specific group of people here. How many pregnant people do I have in the house? Stand up if you're pregnant. I don't think I've ever said that before <laughs> from the microphone. I feel like our kids are supposed to spread out and touch those two bellies. Three. Where's the third? Oh, gosh, sorry. <laughs> okay. Spread out between the three bellies. Seriously. Braden, get out there, man. I want you to touch someone's belly right now. By the way, we're family here, right? Is that okay for them to touch your bellies? All right. Come on, kids. Grab a belly. <laughs> when we were singing that song, I am royalty, I have destiny, I'm going to change the world, and I, that, that line that was saying that you were born for such a time as this, I feel like it is so key this is so key that your child is being born in this time so father I just I thank you for these kids we speak blessing over them and we agree that this is prophetic these children are prophetic they speak to a generation that's arising in the earth. David's. That right in the midst of a generation that doesn't know who they are, someone arises and sings a new song. So we bless the children still in the womb. We thank you that their destiny is sure and that no one can steal it from them. We bind them to every promise God has concerning them. Because, Lord, we know that before they were ever even formed in the mother's womb, you knew them. And you appointed them, and you consecrated them. So I thank you, Lord God, that this is promises wrapped up in flesh. That's what they are. We bless them. Thank you, Lord. For such a time as this, you're being born. Amen? All right. Hug a mom. Okay. Hey, um, just wanted to give an update on uh, Wayne Strite, affectionately known as Pappy. He's, uh, he's doing good. They're going to keep him there. Uh, uh, we stopped by and saw him this morning. Apparently, apparently last night he was ready to go, and so he unhooked stuff, and his blood pressure went up, and the nurse's blood pressure went up, and everybody's <laughs> blood pressure went up. So, uh, so keep him in your prayers. Uh, keep uh, keep Grandma in your prayers too. She was actually going to come in this morning before that happened. That's how much she loves us. She said she just wanted to make sure that everything was in order and everything was taken care of. And um, that just touched my heart, like how much, mm -hmm. how much they love us. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you that they feel our prayers. Pap said, thank everybody. Tell them that he'll be out of there soon. I told him, I said, I'm silently praying that, you know, they don't have to put restraints on you so that you don't get up and leave. But that's just, that's just who they are. So keep them lifted up, um, you know, check in, but, but do it, you know, with understanding that they've got a lot going on, okay? Thanks. Did the kids go yet? Okay. You can go now. Yeah.
Thank you, Lord. I'm going to be in Revelations today. Yeah. Anybody nervous? <laughs> Revelations chapter 2. You keep me on track today, okay? You. I will be done at noon. I will be done at noon. I have no idea what God's going to do. That was good, wasn't it? That was good. Barry saw right through that. Verse 5. He who overcomes will thus be clothed in white garments. And I will not erase his name from the book of life. You guys know that your names are already written in the Lamb's book of life. When God thinks about you and makes you and then puts you in a mother's womb, he has already written down your name. There's already a record of you before there is a you. And you have to get your name erased. Come on, someone say amen. A little different perspective on life, isn't it? So many of us are working so hard to get our name written down. Stop it. It's already written. But his pencil has an eraser. That's the truth. But he who overcomes will be thus clothed in white garments, and I will not erase his name from the book of life, and I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. I got one. Verse 11. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, because he who overcomes will not be hurt by the second death. Verse 17. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, to him I will give some of the hidden manna, and I'll give him a white stone and a new name written on the stone which no one knows but he who receives it. Do you hear that? He who overcomes gets a new name. A name greater than the name that some human gave you. Verse 26. He who overcomes and he who keeps my deeds until the end to him I will give authority over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron as the vessels of the potter are broken to pieces. And I also have received authority from my Father, and I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Chapter 3, verse 5. I got some flipping going on. He who overcomes will thus be clothed in white garments, and I will not erase his name from the book of life. I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Verse 12, he who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. And he will not go out from it anymore. And I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem which comes down out of heaven from my God and my new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Verse 21. And he who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my Father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Does anybody want to overcome? <laughs> huh? Yeah, we're going to talk about that Him. The word overcome in the Greek, I can't say it, but I can tell you what it means. It means to subdue. 
And as soon as I hear that word subdue, I think back to Genesis. Anybody else? And when God forms man in his image, what does he tell him to do? Tells him to be fruitful, multiply. Some men say hallelujah. (laughs) Why aren't you guys laughing? That's funny. (laughs) Fill the earth and subdue it. You guys know that that is part of the original command concerning us, humanity. We're supposed to be fruitful. We talked about this on Wednesday night. Those of you that are here for the Bible study, it's on video. Watch it. Quick little plug. Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth, and then we're supposed to lay hold of it, not just to have it, but to subdue it, to cause it to come under our rule and authority. Hello? Hello? So the word overcome over here, when you go all the way to the last book of the same book, the last book of the Bible, you see that there's several times, like seven, eight-ish, where he tells you, if you overcome, there are certain promises available to you. There are certain things that are going to happen as a result of us subduing. I love the first and the last mentions of things. So that word subdue shows up real early in Scripture, and it's the first command given to us. Be fruitful multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it. Do you guys know that some of the things that you produce still require you to subdue them? Anybody have children? (laughs) They need a little subduction, or whatever the word is. I don't know what the... I'm making up words as we go here. We need to subdue the very things we create, and sometimes the things we create get out of control. And that's when our circumstances start to have rule over us. And that was never the way God created it to be. God created that everything that would flow from us, we would have authority over. And that's why when Courtney was up there talking about how our royalty, our identity, the earth is actually crying out for it, it's because when we recognize who we are, the earth is groaning, waiting for us to fulfill what was originally spoken concerning us. And that's why at the end, he's telling every single one of the churches, if you would overcome, if you would subdue, if you would take the authority that has been given to you, this thing called the cross, this thing called the resurrection, wasn't just for you to get saved and go enjoy heaven. This thing was really about getting back what is ours. To overcome. It's not good enough anymore where sickness and disease can just run rampant in our midst. It's not good enough anymore to let injustices roll around right in our midst. We must overcome to subdue. It actually says to turn, the other other definition of this word to overcome means to take something that is a failure and make it a success. starting with you. Hello? Some of us see in the mirror are way wrong. We see us by our past mistakes or our past stuff, and that's the first thing that needs to overcome. We have to overcome who we are, who we think we are, to who we know we are. That's why Lauren's up there pleading with our souls to recognize who we are. Yet some of us might still walk out of here today like this. Unnecessarily. Actually, that is a walking lie. To walk around like that's a lie. That's not who we are. So I, have to, I, I was asking the obvious question, maybe some of you are too, how do you overcome? Anybody know? Ah, here we go. Later on in Revelation, it says, by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their, our, usins, our testimony, they overcome. And why is it the blood of the Lamb? Let's go to 1 John. Let me just, we're going to have some fun here. First John chapter 5. Verse 1. 
Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. How many people born of God in here? Yeah. And whoever loves the Father loves the child born of him. Uh-oh. That means that anyone who doesn't like his brother has a problem. You cannot love God and hate your brother. Well, Mark, not everyone's my brother. Oh, yes, they are. <laughs> I can pick and choose my No, you can't. I'll know when you really love the Father. That's what it says right here. When you can't help but love people. It just spills out of you. Your response to their attack is love. Your response to their ignoring you is love. Those who love the Father love the child born of him. By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and observe his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments aren't burdensome. For whatever is born of God, what? Overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is the one who overcomes the world? But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. Not with the water only, but with the water and with the blood. It is the Spirit who testifies because the Spirit is truth. There it is again. Guys, your Bible, as great as it is, as powerful as it is, is not truth. He is. He is truth. Stop laying hold of scriptures and lay hold of him. And all the scriptures will begin to make so much more sense. He is the truth. So, go to John now, the, the actual gospel of John. Give me a lot of scripture here and then I'm going to talk to you. Let's just start in uh, 16. Uh, yeah, just, just do 33. These things, verse 33, I have spoken to you so that in me you may have peace. He was telling them about some things that were going to happen to them, and they aren't really good. Talks about how they won't have a home anymore. And he's gonna have to, they're going to be scattered all about, and they were in Acts. Not too many years later, they are all over the place because they're being persecuted for this new gospel they're preaching. And he says, these things I'm speaking to you so that in me you may have peace. <clears throat> in the world you will have tribulation. <laughs> Turn to your neighbor and say, ain't that true? <laughs> yeah. This was a promise given to us. <laughs> that it, Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. That it's not going to be easy. This thing, this is not supposed to be a cakewalk. It's not. It's supposed to be something that is challenging, that causes all of our flesh to rise up and have to make a decision. Am I going to remain? <laughs> or am I going to be shed in the fullness of who I really am come forth? That's what tribulation is all about. Tribulation is about shaving everything off of us that's not helping the glorious gospel on the inside of us. These things I have spoken to you so that you may have peace in me. In the world, you will have tribulation, but take courage. I have overcome. I have subdued. I have taken that which was a failure, and I'm turning it into a success. The world. Hello? The kingdoms of this world, Revelation says, shall become the kingdoms of our God and his do you know where his Christ is? Where is Christ? In us, it's the what? It's the hope of glory. The kingdoms of this world shall become. That's a process. That's an overtime thing. Okay? It doesn't just all of a sudden happen one day. Jesus is going to come and he's going to kick out Obama and whoever else, and you say, okay, kingdoms are mine now. No, it is happening day by day through a people who are awakening to I am royalty. And 
I'm going to change the world. It takes that kind of people to arise. And here's the deal. It says that this is the only place you'll see in Scripture where someone has already overcome the world. It's Jesus. So, all of these scriptures that you see hanging up here, where do we overcome the world? In Him. Do not try to do this on your own. Let me tell you, this life you're living, and that's why, if there's any reason to preach the gospel, if there's any reason to get to cause people to want to walk in relationship with Jesus is because all of them are trying to walk in the world outside of the one who overcame it. And it, it is designed by the enemy to chew people up and spit them out. Please hear this. The whole reason for salvation, if there's any other reason, let's not think about heaven, let's not think about our sins, let's think about simply because of the overall message of the Bible. I created the earth for man to walk in relationship with me. Hello? I wanted a family. That's why he tells Adam and Eve, fill the earth, subdue it. Why? He wants a big old family who has lots of potluck meals. He does. He wants it full and he wants, it, he wants to enjoy them. This, I'm going to tell you, the last hour and a half was an absolute feast for him. He loved it. And it wasn't just because we were all telling him how great he was. It was because they, the people, his kids, were recognizing who they are. And they were hungry for him. Yeah. It wasn't a sitting down holding hymnals and singing out of it. Can we? That's not good enough. We can do that in any business meeting. He's looking for those that are hungry for him. Yeah. Passionate for him. You know, for the last hour and a half, you know what Joey was doing there on the floor? Those of you who could see him? He was interceding for us. He was interceding. He was joining with Jesus for the finish of this thing that God saw back even before Genesis. And the only thing he could say the whole time he was on the ground was Jesus. Because he knows, Father knows, and he revealed it to his spirit, that that is the only way. In him. In him, the fullness of the deity dwells in bodily form. When we walk in that kindle, then there's an overcoming that takes place. Why does everybody need to be saved? Because if they don't, the world overcomes them. And the very identity of who they really are is never realized. And they're unnecessarily beat up. They're unnecessarily taken advantage of. It should cause us to have such a burden for all of our neighbors, all of our co-workers, all of our friends to know this because they should not be suffering. I have overcome the world. So let's go back. I want to read these scriptures again. You don't even have to turn to them if you don't want to. Revelations chapter 2. To him who overcomes, it's not just going to be good here, but I'm going to grant you to eat of the tree of life in the paradise of God. I don't believe that's just for heaven after we pass from this life. I think it's for right now. I believe Jesus is the tree of life. I believe he is the paradise of God. And as we walk in an overcoming way where we subdue the kingdom that's among us. You guys know each one of us has a kingdom. We have a place of rule. We have a place where we have been given authority. It might be as small as your living room. It might be as big as a city or even a nation. And whatever it is, it is our responsibility. Yes, I'm going to use that word. It's our responsibility to carry well this authority that's been given to us. And as we do that, we overcome, we subdue. We cause something that was a failure to become a success. And we get to eat of a really good tree. Verse 11 of chapter 2. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes, he who subdues, will not be hurt by the second death. I'm not exactly sure what that means, but I'm not interested in being hurt. All right? Maybe someone more theologically sound than me can tell us what the second death is. But it doesn't sound good! There's my theology about that one. 
To him who overcomes, verse 17, I will give some of the hidden manna. Do you know that there is some stuff that when you seek out the Lord, there's stuff waiting for us to be had. Because you know what? It's the glory of God to do what, Barry? To conceal a matter. And it's the glory of kings to seek it out, Proverbs 25. You can't just be anybody and get this stuff. If you overcome, if you lay hold, and what we, we sang this, the only way we overcome is to rise up into who we are in Him. We overcome in Him, and then we get some hidden manna, some food other people don't get. And then when you're walking around, they wonder why you look so plump. Why do you shine? Why do you shine when you walk in? Why do you, sh why do you, what, what? I have hidden manna. Well, what's manna? Is good buttered bread baked in heaven. I don't know. <laughs> it's, it's what causes us to shine in a way that people are like drawn, magnetized to us. Verse 26. He who overcomes, he who keeps my deeds until the end. Oh, this is a really good one. I will give him authority over nation. No, that's just for Jesus. No, it's not. It's for anyone who is in him. Guys, I'm telling you, he wants to give us the earth. In fact, he already did. He already did. Mark, come on, man. I can barely cut, take care of my own house. How in the world am I supposed to take care of a nation? It starts right there. You will show yourself approved by taking care of your house. He who rules his own soul is better than he who rules a city. It starts right here. You rule this, God will then. He who is faithful with a little, given much. You start there. Overcome those little things in your life. Here's the word the Lord gave me this morning. It is not a shame to be in a battle. Some of us are in a battle right now, and I'm talking about the personal ones. I'm talking about the ones no one knows. I'm talking about the ones that you are having right now in your own soul and you're ashamed of the battle. And you're, you're wondering why, gosh, I'm a Christian. I sing my songs of worship every Sunday. I pray. I read my Bible. Why am I battling this? It's not a shame to be in battle. It is not shame to be tempted. Someone needed to hear that today. It's a shame not to enter into the battle. It's a shame to say, you know what? Nope, not interested. I can't, I can't be a part of that. Because you can't overcome unless you buy in. Unless you say, you know what? Like Gideon, who was hiding, hoping that no one would find him, and then the angel comes in and says, valiant warrior, let's go. <laughs> valiant warrior? What is his response? You remember Gideon's response when he calls him that? I am the least in the tribe of the least of the tribes. And he says, I don't know what you're seeing, but I'm going to tell you what I see. And God's doing that for someone in here today. He is telling you, I don't know who you think you are, but I know who you are. And so then Gideon rises up and he says, oh man, I need at least, I need 30,000. That'll do it. Once again, he's just trying to cover his own what? His, his weaknesses he's trying to cover because he doesn't want to do the battle on his own. And God says, you know what? Go have him drink water. Just, have, just go run them out to the river and have them drink water. And whoever drinks a certain way, this drink. At the end of it, how many people are left? Well, how's Gideon feel about that? He's about ready to go run back and hide in that little trough he was hiding in. Because he doesn't see himself the way he's, God sees him. I will give authority over the nations. For some of us sitting here in Little Chambersburg, Pennsylvania, that probably sounds like whatever. But I'm telling you, I've been to the nations. I know a lot of you have been to the nations, and he's giving them to you. He wants to give them to you. He wants you to see yourself as this overcoming one in him who can take a nation. I'm convinced of this. I'm convinced of this, that this little town in little Pennsylvania that people in other countries have a hard time even saying our name, they're going to one day know that there are nation takers right here. There are. 
and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. He is not talking about himself. He is talking about us in him. I'm about to sound really out of the box here, but I actually think we're supposed to be ruling nations. The kingdoms of this world shall become kingdoms of our God. Mark, that's just, that's, that's just, that's, no, it's the reality. His desire is that the kingdoms actually are ruled by him through us. This is not a fairy tale for some Hollywood movie. This is the reality. I remember a couple years ago, I did a, you are not doing a very good job of keeping me on track. I'm past my time. God's involved now. <laughs> I remember teaching a Bible study over here a couple of years ago, and I did it about a six-week thing. I said, what would happen if we were given a nation to rule, and the only rule was that we'd have to rule it according to the principles of the kingdom? What would that look like? What would an actual kingdom look like, Anthony, ruled by the principles of the kingdom? You should have heard the arguments. <laughs> it was hilarious. That's because people that were being asked to do that were still trying to figure out how to rule what? Themselves. But this whole thing about overcoming, it's he who overcomes what? What is the thing in your life? Don't say this out loud. What is the thing in your life? What is the person? What is the issue? What is the fleshly part of you that needs to be overcome so that this promise can start to be fulfilled? Do you realize that the battle you're facing right now has eternal consequences for others? If you overcome, someone else will be able to get set free. When you overcome, a nation is crying out saying, if they would just get over blank. If they would just enforce the authority they already have and step over and win that battle, this nation awaits them. Your destiny awaits you. This is not games anymore. This is not just get a job and then hopefully get a promotion before you retire. It's bigger than this. This is serious stuff. That's why every one of these churches is being told, when you overcome, We can tell jokes and have fun about this, but I want to tell you, at the end of the day, the kingdom is serious business. And the king is arising within his people. And he wants to, he wants to give us nations. He wants us to rule them. All right, I'll stop. <laughs> All right. Chapter 3, verse 5. <laughs> Everyone else is like, oh, man, why do you say that? He who overcomes will thus be clothed in white garments. Why would he give white garments, the garments that, of royalty, to someone that doesn't even know that they are? Yet I still love the story of the prodigal son. I love it. A son comes home after wasting his dad's wealth and riches and resources. Comes home smelling like what? Pigs. Dirty. And before he ever gets a chance to get a bath, shower, anything, dad calls out, bring the best robe, get the ring, get everything, and put it on him before all of that. Gosh, God has grace. What does the son say when he comes home? I'm not even worthy to be your... And dad's like, wait a minute. He didn't even know who he was. Dad had to remind him, and the best way to remind him was to clothe him like he was one. But there was still a responsibility, I promise you, for him to overcome. It's not good enough for you just to be clothed in those things and then just walk around all dirty. That's how you get welcomed in. Has anybody ever been welcomed in when they were dirty? Hello? Yeah. <laughs> when you first tell someone that they're a son, they've been living for so long as a slave and eating from the pigs, they have no idea. They've never had a chance. Lazarus, when he walked out of the grave, smelled like death. There's a process of being cleaned up, and then responsibility starts to get put upon us. As long as the heir is a slave, come on, he's no different than a, oh, sorry, as long as the heir is a child, he's no different than a slave. Okay. 
Last one. Verse 12, chapter 3. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar. A pillar in the temple of my God. And he will not go out from it anymore. And I will write on him the name of God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from God, my new name. Jesus, I want that to be said of me. I want you to write your name on me. I want to be a pillar in the temple of my God. I don't just want to be one that constantly people have to take care of and help all the time. At some point in time, all of that help that I have received must transform me into someone that I help. Enough. Someone needs to hear this. Enough of being helped. Enough of having someone else take care of you. It's time for you to arise in your identity. Overcome. And he will make you a pillar in the temple of his God. And you will not go out from it anymore. Someone say amen. Amen. Is anybody tired of being wishy-washy? Is anybody tired of doing this in their lives? Do you know that's not always how it has to be? It doesn't have to be that way. You will not go out from it anymore. And then I will write my name on you. Finally, verse 21. I said finally several times here. Welcome to be. That's why I'm a preacher. He who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne. Is there anything better than that? I I don't know. I feel like that has to be the last one. To sit down with him on his throne. You want to you want to Motivation to overcome, sit with him on his throne. Jesus, I pray for everyone in the room right now. If you have something that I'm just going to close my eyes. If you know that you're in the midst of a battle and you want to overcome, stand with me. You're tired of the wishy-washy. You're tired of the getting beat up. You're tired of being the victim. To him who overcomes, I will grant you to sit with me on my throne. To him who subdues, to him who takes a failure and creates a success. Live in me because I have overcome. I can make you more than a conqueror. I've already won the victory for you. Will you walk with me and in me? And I will be the warrior in your midst. And I will empower you to finally overcome the offense. To finally overcome the temptation. To finally overcome the weakness that has caused you to trip and stumble long enough. I desire for my children to overcome Father welcomes you. The Father says to you today, You're my son. Spirit who is truth. Empower us. Live in us and through us. Breathe life. Baptize us anew and afresh in you. I'm tired of fighting personal battles while there's kingdom battles to be won. It's been long enough. Someone say amen. It's been long enough. I want to rule cities. I want to walk in such a way that the creation responds to me. I want to walk in such a way, Lord, that that people's health literally rejuvenates. And when I walk in the room, you know it's possible. 
I want to walk in a room, Lord, and I want uh, devils on the inside of people to arise and say, no, we'll leave, we'll leave. I want nations to know that they're yours because I go there. To him who overcomes, to him who overcomes, Thank you for already winning a battle we couldn't win on our own, Lord. Thank you for already taking the greatest victory that could ever be taken. But we know that there's other victories to be won, but they're all inside of your victory. That's the hope. <laughs> You've already overcome. You've already overcome. Hallelujah. So in you, Lord, in you, we have already been made complete. That's what it says, Colossians 2. We have already been made complete in you. So now, Lord, let's just walk that out. Love has already won the battle. Thank you, Lord. Father, I intercede for every person in this room because they're going to leave here and it's going to be like a fresh new attack on them. I know it's going to be. Jesus knew it too, and that's why he warned them now. I'm warning you now, these things are going to happen. But you can have peace in me. So, Father, I pray for all of us, as we walk out of this building, something has been seated in us. And we know that in you we overcome. So we're going to walk out of here not afraid. No, no, no. We're going to walk out of here bold. We're going, to, we're going to walk out of here loving the opportunity to overcome. And we're not going to look at failures and say, ah, what a failure. We're going to look at it the same way you looked at the world when you said, I'm about to turn it upside down. Every opportunity, we're going to look at it that way. We're not going to judge it. We're going to love it. And we're going to conquer it and we're going to subdue it for the purposes of the king. Thank you, Lord, that I'm, I, I'm so thankful that I was saved by a king who doesn't want to destroy the kingdoms of this world, but he wants to cause them to become his. Ha, ha, ha! You want them to become yours! That's why I can't hate my city. That's why I can't hate people that are acting outside of how I would act. I can't do it and expect change. I must love them. Let us walk with that kind of spirit, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. Good stuff? Hallelujah. All right, I love you guys. Have a great week. Saturday, 11.45, is that right? 11.45 here. Let's go fill the city with cake.